All right, I guess we'll get started with this uh, nice ceremony and presentation and welcome and all that. Of course, we've already had um, most of the day to spend with our friends from uh, Picatinny, the, uh, the winners of this nice uh, Watts Humphrey Award. And I, I know we've shared a lot of information with them, some of our programs, they've added their, uh, their knowledge of that, and I guess we're gonna hear a little bit from them too now on, uh, on their work. And so we're very happy to have them here. As I mentioned to them earlier today, you know, our friend Watts Humphrey, uh, one of the legends in software engineering, it's, uh, it's really special for us all to be part of that celebration. Uh, I, can, I see Mike Conrad back there, and Mike, of course, spent a lot of time with Watts, as did Bill Nichols, so uh, good to have you here. Uh, Watts influenced all of us, everybody he touched over the years, and it's, uh, it's really nice for us to be able to continue to recognize him. Uh, I do remember when we had a special memorial service in his honor, and we did that in here. And uh, geez, you know, the things you find out about somebody when you have to research their life a little bit to talk about them, it was just amazing. And uh, I mean, I thought I knew him already, but then you find out even more about him. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Julia to move on with the ceremony. So Julia, sure. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for all your support with this award. I was, have been lucky enough to work with Watts for most of my career. Watts hired me here at the SEI, and before that, I worked at IBM using the processes that he designed. Watts went with me to Union Switch and Signal where we taught and implemented personal software process. And when I was living in Japan, Watts would call me and ask me when I was coming back because he was working on something called team software process. I worked with Watts up until a week before he died. Watts was tireless in his dedication to change the world of software engineering, which is what he called his outrageous commitment. He recognized that software was gonna be ubiquitous and an integral part of our lives. And so he understood the need to be able to produce high quality software on time, within budgets, with extraordinary teams. So he was able to figure out how to leverage the concepts and principles that enabled the industrial revolution to knowledge work to make software engineering a true discipline. And for this work, he was awarded the 2003 National Medal of Technology, which is the highest honor awarded by the President of the United States to America's leading innovators, and he became known as the father of software quality. Throughout his illustrious career, Watts has written numerous books. He's gotten countless awards. He got an honorary doctorate from Emory-Riddle Aeronautic University. Um, at IBM, he rose to the rank of vice president, where he was in charge of 15 laboratories across seven countries, over 4,000 engineers. And at the age of 60, instead of retiring, he began his journey here at the SEI, where he founded the process program, the capability maturity model, the CMMI, PSP, and TSP. I've always been so impressed with Watts' technical achievements, but he never ceased to amaze me in other ways. In his 80s, he learned how to play the piano. He always fixed up his own houses. He traveled with a small suitcase. Like, he always was impeccably dressed, but he had this tiny, like, Mary Poppins suitcase that he took. And he always took public tra transportation. I always figured there was nothing that Watts couldn't do, but I will say that Watts was a terrible driver. <laughs> And anybody who has ever traveled with him has some harrowing tale of Watts going up the exit ramp off a highway or making a blind left turn across four lanes of traffic, because I think Jim and I were in the car when he did that. But Watts was also a devoted husband and father. And one time I was working with him in Sarasota and we were having lunch with his wife Barbara. And Watts was reminiscing and telling me stories about taking his seven children sailing on vacation. And Barbara chimed in and said, being on a sailboat with seven kids for a week was not her idea of a vacation, and so she didn't go. And I was completely stunned, because I thought, Watts takes his seven kids sailing? Mike and I can't even take the two kids to the grocery store. <laughs> so that's just the kind of man that he was. Oh, I don't even know what slide I'm on. So the Humphrey Award was established in 1994 and was renamed after Watts upon his death in 2010. The award recognizes outstanding achievements in improving an organization's ability to create and evolve software-dependent systems. 
The past winners of the award include IBM, NASA, Raytheon. Raytheon has won it twice as recently as in 2016. I'm honored to uh, chair such a distinguished committee. Uh, my vice chair is Gerd Hoffner, and uh, other members include Jens Heinrich, Neil Makritish, Ranki Mutharaman, Klaus Newman, and Ed Weller. And the real unsung person is um, our Humphrey Award co coordinator, Michelle Faust. Like, she is the reason why this is such a well-oiled machine. So Michelle, would you stand for a second so we can recognize you? Thank you. So much for everything that you've done. I, I'm serious, I could not do it without you. So Watts was a remarkable man, and this is a remarkable award. To win this award, an organization must have improvements that, to an exceptional degree, are significant, measured, sustained, and shared. So to be significant, we want to see that the improvement effort has breadth and depth throughout the organization, but most importantly, that it relates to the organization being able to achieve their performance goals. To be measured, we want to make sure and see that the organization is using objective data in every way possible to identify what needs to be improved, to understand how best to improve it, and to demonstrate that improvement. To be sustained, we want to see that the process improvement efforts are institutionalized, that quality becomes part of the way that organization does business. And to be shared, we want to see that the organization is sharing their knowledge with their key stakeholders and across local and global software engineering communities. And this organization met all of those criteria. So for this award, we don't just like pick the best one of the nominees we get this year every year, we want to make sure that they truly are exceptional. And that's why when you look in past years, there's many years we didn't, where we didn't bestow the award. Um, some of the quotes from the committee members are that um, this organization had exceptional commitment to process-led, uh, I'm terrible at reading, performance improvement and stellar achievements. Um, that they had that quality mentality. They walk their talk. Their submitted nomination met every requirement specified on the award criteria. And you could see that they applied quality to every product they, they do, that it was their way of life. So um, it was, you know, so this, well, anyway, <laughs> sorry. So this is why I'm getting nervous, is because what's coming up is a 30 word noun string. And I have a tendency to get a tongue tied. So it is my pleasure to announce that the 2018 IEEE Computer Science Software Engineering Institute Watts Humphrey Software Process Achievement Award <laughs> is awarded to the United States Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Armament Centers Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate. So Victor, if you want to come up. I'm just going to, so next on our program will be um, Victor Elias will be presenting on FCSTD's improvement efforts. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're going to do. So, Victor is currently a process assurance representative serving the U.S. Car um, what do you guys say, CCDC? CCDC. CCDC, FCSTDs. <laughs> <laughs> Victor is also an instructor of enterprise process improvement philosophies and methods at the U.S. Armament Graduate School at Picatinny Arsenal. Um, Mr. Elias began working for the U.S. Army in 2004 as a consultant with High Performance Technologies. Prior to working with the U.S. Army, Victor was a quality manager for Johnson Controls, PassLogic, and Titan Singles Products Division. Mr. Elias was also an engineer with Lockheed Missiles and Space Command. So it's my pleasure to go ahead and welcome Victor. Thank you so much. Clicker is all mine. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Now I've got only one button to worry about. <laughs> uh, my name is Victor Elias. Um, thank you all for joining me here. And um, I'd especially like to thank uh, Paul for uh, his opening remarks and uh, your uh, comments this morning. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to be here among people who knew Watts Humphrey by his first name. It's a ver very special thing, and uh, this building is very special, and I, I really enjoyed your hospitality this morning. Um, I'd like to um, use Mr. Nielsen's quote uh, to get us started off. Uh, Watch brought engineering to software engineering. His work had immeasurable impact on the global software community, tirelessly urging the community to emphasize quality, measurement, and performance. Uh, I thought this quote was very special because uh, there is something ascendant about bringing engineering to software en engineering. It was raising the level of uh, performance in the software development industry beyond the prior bounds. And so it enabled people to uh, in, in enjoy a, a better system where they can uh, build cre creative work. Uh, so it was a way for people to work together uh, in, in a way that's enjoyable and creates something for society. Uh, conceptualizing quality is a thought process that is very important to software development. It's what helps people design the best products and services that fit the needs of customers. Um, it's a way to ensure mission success by knowing what people will ultimately be doing with the software that you build. Uh, our organizational culture at the Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate drives us to actively seek process and product improvements to reliably attain the incentives that define mission success for our customers. Uh, the U.S. Army has greatly supported process improvement throughout its history. Of course, from the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense and on down, uh, we've enjoyed support and the Software Engineering Institute itself has enjoyed a great deal of support. Uh, and at the uh, uh, CCDC Armament Center, we've also contributed uh, personnel to help um, uh, build the CMMI models, and uh, we've greatly benefited from our colleagues having the association with the SEI, uh, so we're grateful for that. Um, we have been CMMI maturity level five for 13 years, um, which I think is a very significant level of commitment uh, from all of the people in the workforce. Um, we work with several quality improvement philosophies and methods. Uh, we use uh, an enterprise en excellence model that I'll be talking about shortly. We use CMMI, ISO 9000 series, uh, Lean, Six Sigma, process enrichment, and each of these has its own special aspects that help us improve process performance and ultimately product quality. And we'll talk about those. Uh, so for an uh, overview, we saved several millions of dollars on several programs by better defect management, um, by using a defect leak matrix and a Rayleigh curve model, which are statistically managed processes. We were able to gain uh, some efficiencies that helped us to further integrate desirable product uh, capabilities that our customers had wanted. Um, and I think that that's pretty special for uh, some of our process improvement effort. Our software development uh, consists of integrated product development teams, which include uh, civilians working together with soldiers. Uh, and the benefit there is that we have people in our team that have actually used the software in the uh, armament systems in combat conditions, for example, uh, Irvin Spencer used the, um, our Paladin Howitzer 
in the Gulf War, and he is now training new users how to uh, take advantage of the capabilities of our software. Um, and there are many people that are uh, soldiers and helping us out to uh, gain the best advantage of our software uh, and to, to um, perfect it for the actual use. Uh, in co-ascendance, stakeholders attain valuable products and services as well as organizational learning. And uh, we share the organizational learning uh, with uh, our st stakeholders, which is the Army, uh, the soldiers, the uh, academic institutions that help us. And uh, co-ascendance is a word I'm introducing here. And uh, by the time we get to our final slides, I'll explain that. This is the Sergeant Ryan E. Daltz Armament Software Engineering Center at Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. We're situated on 6,000 acres. We have 64 laboratories. Uh, we have 6,000 employees that are very grateful for uh, this award. Uh, but this is the uh, headquarters of the Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate. We have 275 employees uh, that are involved in science and engineering and uh, upgrading and integrating software and armament systems. Uh, where we do it is right there in that tall building, which we call the high bay. Uh, we can bring uh, vehicles in there for testing, uh, for validation, integration testing, and uh, where the high bay is surrounded by engineering labs. And we do much of our work there, but um, we, are, we also have some organizations around the arsenal that help us. This is the structure of our organization. Uh, we have a director up at the top, and uh, we have three main branches, the uh, Munitions Engineering and Technology Center, the Weapons and Software Engineering Center, and the Enterprise System Integration Center. Uh, the Fire Control Systems and Technology Director is highlighted in blue within the Weapons and Software Engineering Center. One of the things that we enjoy from the executive leadership is uh, su their support and encouragement for process improvement. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the Weapons and Software Engineering Center's Executive Director, uh, Ms. Cynthia, Cynthia Perazzo. Um, a virtual organization we call the Armament SCC is comprised of the four organizations highlighted in blue. Uh, that's us, the Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate. We work with uh, Tactical Effects Protection and Interactive Technologies Directorate, Armament Software Engineering Center, as well as the Quality Engineering and Systems Assurance Directorate. These organizations have common organizational processes, policies, templates, tools, and training. Uh, we have common objectives and measurements, uh, and we're able to roll those up and do reports on them and help to further our processes by uh, evaluating how they're actually performing in the various directorates. Uh, the Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate consists of six divisions, each with from two to four branches the Armored Vehicle Fire Control and System Future Systems Directorate Division, sorry, Artillery Fire Control Systems Division, Automated Test Systems Division, Firing Tables and Ballistics Division, Order and Common Fire Control Systems, Small Arms Fire Control and Optics Technology Division. Uh, the vision of the Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate is to deliver innovative fire control and test measurement and diagnostic equipment solutions for today and tomorrow. Our mission is to execute the technical and programmatic life cycle engineering efforts for armament fire control systems and associated training, simulation, and automated test systems. Uh, our process improvement journey is an interesting one. Uh, we started in 2004 by building slowly our processes and uh, e evolving towards uh, the CMMI at maturity level five, 
the first project that was able to internally assess at maturity level five for our development processes was the Paladin program. And um, we had what's called a senior management review, which was attended by Pat Soreo, who was the actor, acting director at the time. And he said that Paladin proved that it could be done. And uh, we went on in 2006 to actually be independently audited, audited by a, an SEI sanctioned auditor and we were found to be compliant with CMMI at maturity level five. We repeated that again in 2010, 2013, 2016 and uh, in 2018 we just received a pretty nice award I would say. <laughs> Um, we're, we're working on version two and we hope to complete that soon. All right. Um, so one of the important things that we do uh, to develop our processes is we work from templates uh, that the organization shares and so we have a common defined process. Uh, that common defined process includes a multitude of plans that are for specific purposes, obviously. Project plans really cover the whole gamut, but we also have conf a, a dozen other plans, risk management plans, software test plans, uh, and we also have project level goals, which are an interpretation of the organization's goals. Um, we have process assurance personnel that uh, monitor the implementation of these processes to see that the advantages of uh, the CMMI are included and we, we learn things. For example, um, we, we thought it was good enough to, to do, do risk management plans that only went to uh, remediation of defects, but we also added contingency plans. Um, so the CMMI was very helpful to us to, to learn the finer points of best practices. One of the things that uh, as I mentioned before were senior management reviews. Uh, when people, uh, when our senior managers come to the senior management reviews, they enjoy an overview of project performance, um, schedule, cost and effort, um, and many of the statistics we're going to get into pretty soon. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to share lessons learned and best practices with them and obtain their feedback. Um, one of the good ways to get personnel in a software development organization to participate is to have them have a can-do attitude and I think that that is exemplified by the way our development personnel were. This is the Paladin self-propelled howitzer. Uh, as our title indicates, the Fire Control Systems and Technology Director would make the fire control software for this armament system. We uh, have a NATO ballistic kernel which helps us to uh, orient the vehicle so that it fires accurately. Uh, it's a tracked vehicle so it can go get on the move. Uh, it, we also develop software uh, for diagnostics and system health. And um, I'd like to point out that um, Mr. Humphrey said that quality must be the organization's highest priority. And so I would ask what is quality and what, why must quality be the organization's highest priority? So quality can be defined as it should be defined as the ability of performance to enact a strategy. So if you think of quality as the ability of performance to enact a strategy, you can see that there's a relationship between strategy and quality. Um, and because there's that relationship, you would have to th consider that um, quality excellence would also be determined by, how, by what the customer's strategy for use of your product or service is. So, when you establish quality excellence for a product or service, any deviation from that concept of quality excellence becomes a risk of poor performance. So what I'm saying is that strategy, quality, and risk are interrelated as parts of a conceptual system. 
Um, and it's by having an excellent knowledge of that system that we know the elements of quality strategy risk and the aspiration that's behind the product and service, and it helps us to improve the product and service uh, for our customers' use. Um, conceptualizing quality is a thought process, um, and putting together a strategy quality and risk is, is a good way to think of um, quality, because um, in the last century, conformance to requirements was used effectively to uh, create products like uh, machine products like metals and things that you can cut and see on a blueprint. But in the software world, you have to conceptualize quality in a different way uh, than conformance to requirements because you may have to develop the requirements on your own and uh, you might have to develop derived requirements that are unspecified by the customer. So the better you're able to understand the customer's strategy of use of your product, uh, the better you can create the undefined requirements like defined requirements, like derivative requirements. Um, so one of the principles that uh, I like to talk about is that the basis for winning competitive warfare, warfare consists essentially in the achievement of one condition, competitors with a relatively high risk of poor performance. Um, so the insight from, from this uh, principle is that you should create products that have um, high quality uh, and integrate in innovation uh, so that you're competitive uh, or, or just reaching for quality excellence. And um, w when you're seeking quality excellence, uh, you remove risks of poor performance so that you can achieve it. Um, so it sounds kind of simple, but innovate and remove risks of poor performance. This is the enterprise excellence model that was developed by Dr. Lannon. He was our uh, director at one time, and it's a cr pretty good way to see how the pieces of uh, our process approach fit together. Uh, voice of the customer, uh, Six Sigma, Lean, Baldrige criteria, CMMI and ISO, they all serve slightly different processes and it's helpful to see that they all fit together uh, in a way that helps us improve processes. Um, the following are the common top level goals of the Armament SCC's process improvement effort improve predictability, consistency, and quality of our products and services, increase productivity and reduce cycle time, maintain and enhance our core competencies, improve customer satisfaction, and improve our competitive advantage. Uh, this is a trace matrix that shows uh, from the top level goals uh, down to the business objectives and the common measurements that we share across the Armam and FCC. Um, we're going to look at some of these uh, statistical measures and highlight some of the things that we learned along the way of doing them. Um, one of the things that we had to appreciate was how uh, we could get into some of the CMMI processes like CAR and DAR. CAR is causal analysis and resolution, and DAR is decision analysis and resolution. Uh, so each, each pr uh, of those two processes has a, a value and uh, we use them pretty regularly. I'll explain in one of the examples how we've used CAR and DAR. Um, but sometimes a process needs to be under closer review and we integrate a statistical process, statistically managed process to review it until we uh, stabilize the process at good a level of performance. Um, any organization that does CMMI has to uh, perform pr process compliance measurements and what we've done here are incremental process improvement measurements. So we would take a su subgroup of a handful of processes at a time from the CMMI model 
and measure them across uh, a, a dozen pro pro projects. Um, and ultimately, we measure all of the process areas that are applicable to d the different projects, like the support projects uh, are different than projects like Paladin that are development <coughs> projects. Um, and then we prepare for external audits. And uh, we've had some very good results. Uh, the last three independent external audits that we achieved maturity level five at had no uh, <coughs> findings for corrective action. Um, this is a um, statistically managed process for measuring defect volume. Uh, the Rayleigh curve is, is a model that shows what the shape of the arrival of defects uh, is expected to have over the course of a project's life cycle. Um, in, in, in the chart to the right, you can see that there's a, a bit of a spike at, at, in the initial phases of documentation uh, peer review. Uh, once people start creating things, we start having defects. So uh, then we have code and unit test. There's a little spike there. And then towards the end, we have integration testing where uh, software is actually test put together and tested as a whole. Uh, the current defect removal is at 78.75% prior to FQT. So I think we're in good shape going into FQT. Um, this statistical measure is very interesting because uh, it's where we were able to actually save a significant amount of money. Um, it's called a defect containment measure. And it shows that in the early life cycle phases of our projects, we're getting very good at uh, running a lot of peer reviews that find defects very early so that they don't affect subsequent life cycle phases. And uh, since they don't affect future life cycle phases, I think we can get a lot more done in less time. Um, and as the uh, chart in the lower right shows, um, we went from like $4 million to just about $2 million in costs of uh, late life cycle uh, PCRs or problem change reports, which is another word for defect uh, reports. And so saving $2 million is a very good thing. Um, earned value management statistics are, uh, show us where we are stand in cost and schedule performance. Uh, we monitor the cost performance index and the schedule performance index. Uh, each of them is intended to uh, achieve a value of one, and that's good. Um, but we've set limits of plus or minus 15% variation from <coughs> one as good performance. The reason for that is that um, projects that are starting up uh, will tend to have higher variation than later stage projects. So those limits have historically worked well for us. Um, maintaining customer satisfaction survey results above 3.8 is important uh, for the organization. At the uh, project level, we have uh, user juries where we actually meet soldiers that are uh, testing and evaluating our software. and they can tell us what their, ex what their experiences have been out in the field. And that's a very helpful way for us to find out the, the true nature of our software as they're using it. Um, we also have an expectation that 90% of um, the employees will take organizational sta standard process training within three months of the up OSP updates. And that helps us have the entire workforce well trained. They take a test to determine uh, if they've mastered the material. This is a queuing analysis study, which was done to see uh, how many servers were needed in the uh, audit process. At the time this was done, uh, one auditor was responsible for three 
maturity level five processes projects at the same time. And uh, we wanted to find out if one server was adequate. Um, so the queuing study, uh, it actually matched the expectations for a queuing study by having random arrival, uh, inter-arrival times um, and relatively uh, random service times because the projects varied slightly. Uh, so it was a pretty good implementation of a queuing study. Uh, and what's good about the queuing study is that you have managerially useful statistics that come out of it. Uh, it's unlike uh, traditional statistical process control where you have um, numbers that just um, don't, don't um, clearly come give you an impression of what's happening. Here you could tell what the service rate is, the server utilization, the number of uh, pro uh, projects still awaiting an audit, that sort of thing. Uh, so queuing study is very good for processes. Um, the chart on the lower right shows economic optimization where we found out, um, unfortunately, we only needed the one server to do the three projects at that time. Because quality is the fire control systems and technology director its highest priority, as Mr. Watts Humphrey suggested it should be, our workforce can conceptualize quality and can create strategic quality excellence in our products and services. Warfighters get products and services that overmatch adversaries. We gained a sustainable competitive advantage in the ability to create innovative products and services faster and cheaper through a dependable system. We achieved and sustained maturity level five for more than 13 years. We developed objectives, measurements, and improvements that saved millions of dollars. And our stakeholders attained the incentives that they expect. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to define the word co-ascendance because I think it's a really good word. It describes the condition of people working together under the influence of an attractive common goal to create new and greater level of quality excellence, using their talents to remove risks of poor performance wherever they appear. Uh, Coincendence was inspired by the Apollo 11 mission. The Fire Control Systems and Technology Directorate's collaboration with warfighters, the US Army, scientists and engineers, industry and academia, and with communities of software and test systems developers towards the common cause of creating strategically excellent products and services with a workforce that is continually learning and growing and creating new sciences as well as innovations in technology that support our national interests is co -ascendant. It's a professional experience we're fortunate to have. And before I get to questions, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Humphrey have the last word. Um, the issue is how we really can learn as a society to work together to do really effective, very high quality, creative work in a way that will help advance mankind. And with that, um, I'll leave it for questions. We have. Uh, Victor, thank you. That was, that was outstanding and, and also very inspiring. Uh, you mentioned that you were able to sustain a chart level five for 13 years. How were you able to do that uh, in terms of your commitment to quality? You know, there's new people always, you know, you've got workforce issues, you've got new uh, technologies that are coming your way that you've got to factor in, uh, new strategies, new plans. You know, how do you sustain that level of commitment to your quality? Great question, thank you. Um, we, we do work for soldiers in the field, and I think it, it's always in our mind when we go into the Sergeant Ryan E. Dolt's uh, Armament Software Engineering Center that we're working somewhere that's important to soldiers. And I, th I think, you know, since we're not in the battle, we're making software, and that's our battle. And I think people have that in the back of their mind to do the best that they can. Um, and that really is motivating. There are a lot of special people in our organization, as I mentioned, that participated in developing the CMMI. And um, 
they're also encouraging us at every step of the way to keep, keep up the good work, and uh, they've succeeded. I don't want to add to that. I think it's yes. part of the general culture of how we do things. Yeah. You know, it's part of it. You know, it is a process, but it's a standard way of doing things. So uh, even when a new project is stood up, you're going to uh, inherit the culture and more broad projects. So I mean, if you have, it, it's easy, I think, when you're doing the same project, you just kind of continue when you're doing right. it. But is it, if you're a new project, uh, understand what the organization goals are, be able to, before you lay a plan, and be able to, I, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I'd like to just reiterate what Victor was saying. You have a common platform, like your soldiers, and then what you do day in and day out means they come home. That, you know, it's like it's hard to not think about it how to, it's a compelling, you know, reason to do what we do. How stable is your workforce? It's 50 years or so. It's 50 years. Wow. Um, they never leave. <laughs> We have to wait for them to retire, so. So you've had a relatively stable workforce. That's good. It's, yeah. Yeah, I think with the org, you know, with the organic yeah. government people, um, very yeah. rarely you see government people leave government. Um, sometimes you see them move around with employees yes. to do different things. So they still stay with the, the organization, but surprisingly, even contractors, uh, you know, it's just, uh, when I'm trying to, to, to talk to people, convince them to go to the government, say, hey, you know, it's good, guys. people don't leave. Yeah, we have a good thing going here. I think part of that is going to go to Senator Victor say, um, just understanding what we're doing is uh, bigger than yourselves. You know, we're, we're doing something important. We have a very important mission. So that may help explain the kind of momentum that you have to maintain. <coughs> the team's coming kind of together all the time. Quite, quite so, yeah. It's, it's really uh, good that we can work on. Uh, extended efforts to, to make better processes um, because people are there for so long. And uh, y y you get to see p people's insights when you're uh, onto something for that long. And uh, that really makes the difference in uh, perfecting processes and not making them overburdensome uh, it's so that they work for the people that are using them. Uh, that, that really makes our products, processes very good. Um, if the phone right here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I heard a little bit about why the, uh, the motivation of working for causes uh, that's above and beyond, it's bigger than themselves. What else can you do for motivation, like uh, the commitment to the process, the ownership of the work the process, or the uh, commitment to personal excellence? <laughs> um. Well, the people that I work with, uh, 275 folks in the Fire Control System and Technology Directorate, uh, 157 of them ha have bachelor's degrees, 117 have master's degrees, five PhDs. Uh, it's a very sophisticated group, and, and they're very professional. They take their work seriously. Um, they're into the technology of the products that they develop, and I think, um, humans have a fundamental need to improve things and when we work together in these teams uh, it brings out the uh, excitement of building something together and when we build something together as all of the stakeholders benefit from it that's what I was talking about with co-ascendance and I think you folks here that have worked on the CMMI with Mr. Humphrey who brought engineering to quality engineering <coughs> can really appreciate how when you're creating something uh, better than the previous standard of quality excellence, it brings out your best effort and uh, it helps you remove risks of poor performance wherever they happen. And that's kind of the idea behind the uh, co-ascendant idea w that was um, inspired by Apollo 11. I think a little bit in our culture, so you don't come to the government to, to get rich. Yeah, we don't pay a lot of money. But um, there's a healthy competition, and, um, and being on the teams that are constantly improving and that are on this journey add to what you get at work. So I think that people kind of gravitate toward that. It's culture, right? We, we don't get a lot of money, but 
you, you know, you get a little bit of a, a reward from being on these teams <coughs> and uh, accumulating these assets. So it's just a little perk, if you will, that we can do. And I mean, any culture, I guess, you know, that celebrates, you know, a lot of it's about the celebration of what we're doing. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, gentleman back there? Yes? <laughs> well, what has the uh, impact of winning the award uh, had for your directorate? Could you speak a little bit to, was it a sh shared sense of accomplishment? Uh, speak a little bit to that, please. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, uh, I can't imagine what I'm going to go home to. Uh, but I think New Jersey is going to be a very happy town. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I've, just this morning I, I got another high five and um, I'm walking down the hall and I'm getting high fives and uh, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, it, it's such a revered award and uh, it's the people that have worked so hard for it, um, they deserve it. And I think um, they're totally going to appreciate it. Uh, all right. Yes, sir. Um, one of the speakers this morning mentioned that there are reduced volumes of custom software that increases the amount of components that are being incorporated in the systems. Has that reached FC, SKB, and if so, how are you guys at that? Um, so, so the question is that our are, are you seeing the, the, the movement for component-based systems where you're incorporating outside software? Is that reaching you? Um, when I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I think you know a lot of our um, software products are uh, very specific to applications on top on a weapon system. Uh, and it's not just Paladin. There are several weapon systems that we uh, create uh, software for. For example, the fire control software in our NATO ballistic kernel goes out to 20 different countries. So it has to be modular, interactive, and it has to be peer reviewed and uh, tested in so many different ways. Uh, when we do use external software, it would be uh, what are we going to use for uh, defect management or for uh, requirements management and we'll do a DAR or to decide among alternatives for different software like that. Um, I'm not sure I'm really getting at what you were asking but um, we, we've got a couple of developers here that would be happy to chat with you. I, I think uh, that you're getting kind of hit on a little bit. For the application software on the actual platforms uh, it's also solved in a house developer or another government agency that we interface with. For other things, uh, support websites and such, that's happening a little bit. But this, this focus of very much on platform software, so it's not really beneficial for us. I guess I will say at a vehicle level, so the how how did we work on the field of version is name six. There's maybe three things on that gun that have software on them that are operating. The new version, the A7, has like 15 or something. So it's getting there. You know, we are seeing more and more LRUs on these vehicles. It's kind of at a manageable level still. And most of the software either comes from UAE, who's the, the prime contractor for, for the vehicle, or directly from, from us. So it's really, it's a two kind of shop interaction, even if there's multiple software products on the, on the vehicle. Um, it, there are some uh, improvements in hardware. For example, we upgrade our hardware systems to the new technologies, new Intel, whatever is inside our stuff. To um, we converted um, fire control software that used to fit in a suitcase into a, a lightweight uh, handheld uh, computer. And, and that was a significant miniaturization that helped people in the field walk around with it and um, aim their weapons. Um, important stuff. Uh, important to be light and portable. All right. Okay. 
So, Victor, question. So, like, um, how do you how do you do your process updates? Do you do them annually? Because you say you train people on when the process is considered approved. Do you have like what's your schedule for how you do that? How do you probably change this across all the different projects? So um, I, I mentioned there were about two dozen project level processes uh, or plans that we've implemented. Those are uh, on a semi-annual schedule. They're peer reviewed among the team and then peer reviewed independently, usually by uh, business area managers. Uh, we also review the organizational processes, policies, procedures, templates, tools, and training uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and that's when we test employees on how, how well they can uh, identify and be conversant with uh, particular uh, aspects of our policies and procedures. Um, and also, the, uh, a great learning experience is from the audits themselves, where the independent auditors come in. Uh, it's a three-stage system, usually class C, B, and then A, where uh, at the class B, we go in for interviews, our team leads show that they have experience with the processes, they know them backwards and forwards. Um, and uh, it's become you know, a very common practice for us. And uh, we haven't just stopped at uh, CMMI maturity level five. What we do is uh, we make our processes more effective, like the Rayleigh curve, for example. It, it, it was acceptable to just have a statistically managed process, but what we did is we moved the peer reviews earlier up and intensified that so that we ended up with a more effective process. Uh, we sustain our processes with uh, templates that um, improve and uh, we also work with the people in the system to learn what they've experienced with the processes so that we can use their uh, learning and uh, good examples to, to build further. Um, and then we share our processes with new projects that come into our organization, like uh, Tepet, for example, only in our last audit became level five uh, because they did a good job with us. And uh, they were able to take benefit of our established organizational processes. All right. All right. Please. I'll turn, it, I'll turn it back to Jim. We have a reception following that's going to be in the cafeteria, so we hope you'll join us. And I just want to make a plug that the nominations are open for the 2019 Humphrey Award. So if you know of any organization that's interested, I think we have postcards back there that you can pick up as well. But um, wonderful, wonderful presentation, and so happy so that you guys won this award. So impressed. Thank you. Thank you.